is um, entitled Come and See Christianity. And I'm excited that we can um, share this as a first topic of the season because I think discipleship is something that um, many of our churches lack and um, many struggle with, uh, with having a really good discipleship strategy uh, in the local church. So I think whenever we can talk discipleship um, and especially tonight to hear a testimony of a church that's um, uh, making it work in their context and not just in one place, but um, uh, over uh, many, many places, not only in the United States, but around the world. Um, I'm Sandy Coelho, and I serve as the Leadership Development Director at the Baptist Convention of New England. And um, I not only um, uh, oversee discipleship and small groups, but kids ministry, English as a second language, hunger ministries, addiction ministries, and all sorts of other things at the Baptist Convention of New England. And if you need to reach out to me, you'll see my email right there on the screen. And we'll be sure that if you have any needs, I'd be glad to help you. Um, but I'm excited tonight to introduce my special guest. Um, many of you know him. He is um, Pastor Jeff Pearson, uh, the lead pastor of the Bridge Church, churches in Vermont, Maryland, throughout Uganda, Kenya, the Congo, and across India. So, uh, Pastor Jeff, I want to welcome you to our webinar, and um, he's going to give us a short testimony and take it away. Hi, Pastor Jeff. Good to have you. Well, thank you, Sandy. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I want to just first of all say thank you to everyone that has been a part of making this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been so blessed, so, so blessed. Um, as the pastor of the bridge, I just want to first go back to what you shared on the cooperative program. Uh, the bridge family is born out of the cooperative program and we've been so twice. And so uh, we, we probably more than most want to attest to the blessing of what God does through the cooperative program. And it is something that we've seen touch the world locally, regionally, and globally. But uh, again, back to tonight, I just want to thank you for the privilege uh, to speak to Discipleship is for me both one of my mm -hmm. greatest passions and one of my greatest privileges. And to do it in the context of a, a family sharing time is, uh, again, really just truly, truly a blessing. If I could, I'd like to just point out what you're seeing right now on the screen, Come and See Christianity, is uh, it's a, a passion of ours as the Bridge family. And what I'm going to share is truly a invitation to come and see Christianity. Discipleship is an essence and at the core of Christianity. For those that uh, may not be familiar with us, you can go to comeandseechristianity.com and you'll be brought into a much deeper and richer experience. Tonight, my goal is to give you an introduction and to share with you some universal biblical missional principles that I can tell you will work anywhere and everywhere in the world. Not because of anything that we've discovered or deployed, but because it's God's word in action. That's what we've done is we've simply walked through the word of God, seen what is his will and have identified his ways and we are bringing that out, again, not out of a sense of creativity, but out of a commitment to Christ-likeness. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and just give you, by way of introduction, a, a quick explanation of what we'll be doing tonight. In this webinar, we're going to introduce the Come and See Christianity tools, the truth and love of God's word. And I'm gonna give you a brief introduction and then we're going to look at four components that are essential for biblical discipleship. Vision, mission, definition, and devotion. And what I'd like to do is take about 10 or 12 minutes with each one 
and then give a couple of minutes for Q&A. But I want you to also know that there'll be a time at the end that I'll leave open for Q&A. So if in one section you don't get your answer, your questions answered, just know that we'll have a time at the end as well. But again, my hope is to bring to you an introduction that will lead to a deeper hunger and thirst. And just know that we can be reached through hisbridge.com or comeandseechristianity.com. And if you're a believer, and especially if you're a leader, you'll see tonight I am speaking at the leadership level to those who are going to be pouring into others, whether it's at the pastoral level, the missional level, or in your home at the kitchen table. What you're going to see will be a part of what God wants for you and from you, no matter who you are or where you are. So with that said, let me press in now and just again say by way of introduction, what we're going to be looking at tonight is biblical versus cultural discipleship. Biblical discipleship versus cultural. And by cultural, I don't just mean what's out in the world. I mean, sadly, what's in the church today. There is so much consumerism and so much felt need, so much attraction model that I believe one of the great challenges in the church today is that we've lost our way. So many who are claiming to be making disciples are doing nothing more than appeasing consumers. So we need to get back to God's word, God's will, and God's ways. Truly biblical discipleship. And we'll look at, again, vision, mission, definition, and devotion. But first to this word biblical, let me just point out, when we say biblical, we're talking about truth in love, and that biblical discipleship could and should always be completely Christian, completely Christian. What I mean by that is no blending. There's no amount of world that should ever get into and permeate worship. So when we talk about biblical discipleship, we're talking about Ephesians 4.15, what the world needs, the world that's being tossed about by the winds and the waves of the world's cunning deception. What's needed is true, pure, pure truth and love. So completely Christian discipleship. Number two, comprehensive discipleship, the whole thing. We can't just go around and ask people if they want to go to heaven. We can't present a Jesus that is only love without truth or holiness or wrath or consequence. So biblical discipleship will be completely Christian. It will be comprehensive. And then it will also be coherently cohesive. Coherently, meaning that it must be put into the language of those that are listening. That the burden of effective communication rests on the Christian. We are the ones who are to be coherent to those who are being shared with, and at the same time, cohesive. We need to be the ones that are going to show the world how our walk, our work, our worship, our warfare all comes together cohesively in the gospel and for the glory of God, all while maintaining and understanding that all of this is by God's grace alone. So when we talk about biblical, it brings me to where I want to begin with every discipleship encounter, whether it's a one-time conversation with somebody on an airplane that I'm only going to talk to for 30 minutes, or if it's in our leadership development where I'm going to spend literally years pouring in, we always begin with 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, because this becomes the great equalizer. We know that we know that we know that while opinions abound and everybody has some, it's God's word that can be trusted at all times in every circumstance. Remember, it's God's word that tells us that all scripture is God breathed and it's profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped, may be complete and ready for every good work. So when we begin, and talk about biblical discipleship, let us remember that if it does not 
come through the word of God, if it's not consistent with the word of God, it's not biblical. Therefore, with that understood, we recognize that we're now ready to get into this sense of vision. Well, vision in terms of biblical discipleship, I think can be summarized this way. Christians and Christianity, the vision for the church is that we are the blessed people of God who get to, who get to find the lost and grow the found. Note the dual privilege and responsibility. It's not enough to just go out and say, we found a bunch of people who became believers and we created this spiritual orphanage. No, we're called to do both. Go and find, and then, by God's grace, grow so that we can send out. When we talk about this, we recognize that we need to be devoted to bringing God glory, devoted to bringing God glory by finding and growing more glorifiers. I offer it to you this way. As a bridge family, we say that we are an Acts 1-8 family. We share one faith as one family with one focus. And Acts 1-8 grounds all of who we are in this vision together. We're victorious in Christ through this vision because we know that as he said, we've received his power with his spirit that we may be his people and his people locally, regionally, and globally. I cannot stress this enough. So much of what's lost in discipleship today is lost because of the myopic views of those who claim to be missionaries. We say, well, you know, somebody else will go there. Somebody else will do that. But when Christ gave the vision for his people and his mission, it was he who said that we would have a global reach through a local extension, that we would be local, regional, and global. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem local, Judea and Samaria, regional, and to the ends of the earth, global. To have a sense of discipleship that does not have an Acts 1-8 Great Commission global perspective is not biblical discipleship. I can't stress that enough. Now, for us, and I would offer this to anybody else that would be blessed to use it, we've recognized that there is a need for clarity with vision. And so we've put 12 distinctive couplets together. We say that we are responding to grace and repenting of sin. This is biblical discipleship, biblical being, responding to grace and repenting of sin, trusting the Bible and obeying God's word, growing in Christ and living spirit-led, praying for guidance and following by faith. We are dying to ourselves and carrying our crosses. We're being the church, being the church and loving one another, truly loving one another. We're equipping the saints and we're exemplifying supernatural unity. We're ministering as ambassadors and we're discerning matters shrewdly. We're worshiping God vertically and we're experiencing him horizontally. We're proclaiming the gospel no matter what, and we are fishing for men. We're making discipled warriors, and we're winning spiritual warfare. We're loving our king, and ultimately, we are serving his kingdom. You see, this is biblical vision for biblical discipleship. And remember, it's God and his word who say in Proverbs 29, 18, that without vision, Without a prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. The King James says the people perish. This need for biblical vision is essential. I want you to realize that if your people or those that you're trying to pour into, they cannot be what they cannot see. We need to give the clarity of a biblical bullseye at the very beginning. This is absolutely essential. Now, to do that, we share what we call the flow. And again, I offer this to you. It comes with our Come and See Christianity Discipleship Tooling. The flow is a way to give clarity to vision at the broadest level. So if I were going to meet somebody 
who was not a believer and they said, okay, so give me the big picture. What's the big picture with this whole Christianity thing? We bring clarity by bringing the flow to them. The flow is to acknowledge this sequence of numbers. If you can remember one, three, five, seven, 12, and 24, you'll have the opportunity and the ability now to bring a framework in to an understanding of Christianity. And again, understand that there needs to be a vision before we set out on a mission. And the vision says, number one, there is a divine design. Christians would know this as a biblical worldview. It's the gospel-centric understanding of all things. One divine design. You'll see that there are three divisions in every human being, the head, the heart, and the hands, what we think, what we love, and what we do. We say that there are five types of people in the world. That's it. Every human being is one of five types of disciples. I'll show that to you here shortly. That there are seven details or fundamentals that every person needs to know to understand Christianity. We then offer 12 disciplines or heart exercises that would help the heart to grow, again, for every person. And then 24 distinctives, which will show how we love and live as the people of God. Without an understanding, without a sense of vision, this is going to be very difficult for anybody to ever become. So the one divine design, here's a portrait of the three divisions. We use what we know of as a Venn diagram, the three circles, and say what you think, what you love, and what you do are merged together to define who you are. Consequently, discipleship needs to bring truth to the head, exercises for the heart to grow, and real deal work and warfare for the hands. And we don't just bring these, we evaluate these. You'll see before we're done that this is a way of understanding every human in their wholeness. And you see they're numbered one, two, three, first truth, then love, then work. And the ABC is to then show the subsets. We must accept the truth and the love. We must be, become the love and the work. And we must commit and have consistency in that commitment between the work and the truth. And when one, two, three, A, B, C have merged, you have at the center a Christian. This is the biblical disciple, and this is the one who's going to grow. Now, what do they look like? And you see them here. These are the five human beings on the planet. Everybody in the world fits into one of these five people. The lost who are dead in their sin before the cross. The baby Christian who just came to life. The new lover is what we call them, the baby believer, the growing learner, the budding leader, and then ultimately that lifer. And I'll give you definitions and descriptions of them here in a little bit. But see that all of humanity, past, present, and future, fit into one of five categories. Every person that has ever been is, has either lived and died as a lost person, a lover, a learner, a leader, or a lifer. Those seven details, the fundamentals, we call them sometimes. We need to understand the foundations. We need to have a vision and an understanding for the foundations, God's word, God's will, and God's ways. Everything is built on those foundations. The framework is what I just showed you. Every human being fits into one of those five categories, loss, lover, learner, leader, or lifer. The facts, which will explain all of creation and history. Everything began with creator, Christ, creator, and creation. We came to a time of corruption. Corruption was cured when Christ came. Christ then left his church in charge until he is coming back. We have creator, corruption, Christ. We have church, and then we have coming back. The fight speaks to spiritual warfare. The fact that every one of us is in a spiritual war, whether we know it or not, and we need to be ready. We need to understand this spiritual warfare. Otherwise, like so many in the past have heard, hey, raise your hand, come down the aisle, claim to be a Christian or do what the pastor said, and he'll call you a Christian. 
Then Monday morning comes along, and before you know it, they get hit upside the head with a spiritual two by four. And they must they start thinking, well, apparently either I didn't do it right at the church yesterday, or this God isn't all they say he is, because this war has just crushed me. There's a lack of understanding of the reality of spiritual warfare. We need to bring an understanding and this being able to see this vision from the very beginning. Next, as we explain the faith, you would know this as the gospel. I'll show you that here before we're done in a way that brings both vision and mission into clarity biblically. We talk then about the family of God to understand what it is to love up, to love in, and to love out the true biblical family of God. And then lastly, it's almost anticlimactic, but we speak about the forever, understanding the fundamental biblical perspective and vision on forever, which is to say from here, every single person is either going to heaven or to hell forever. We bring clarity to this vision. The heart exercises that I spoke of, the 12 disciplines, we use the acronym Jesus's Peace Sword to give clarity to these 12 heart exercises. J is for journaling. E is for eat nothing or fasting. S is for scripture intake. U is for understudying of that scripture intake. The second S, the apostrophe S, is for solitude, time alone with the Lord. The I'm sorry, then the apostrophe S, the third S, is for stewardship, the exercise of taking your time, your talent, and your treasure and literally giving it to the Lord. The P is for prayer. The S of sword is for serving. The W is for worship. The O is for outreach. The R is for relationships. And the D is for development. As we press in and and I hope you can see, I'm doing a quick flyby here, just touching the tops of these trees in the forest of faith. Each one of these is itself a, a time and a topic that we pour into greatly. And I'll show you um, that we do this at five different levels. There's a need for the lost to get it kind of like what we're doing today, just a quick brief covering of here's some of what you should and could expect if you want to come into the Christian realm. With the baby lover, instead of engaging the lost with kind of an introduction, with the lover, we explain these things. With the learner, we press in further. We begin to equip with these things. For the leader, we begin to empower these things that they can then in turn become a multiplier. And with the lifer, they are those who are exemplifying these things and exponentially leading and multiplying leaders. Lastly, I said to you about the 24, the distinctives. These come back to what we shared earlier in the vision. We call it our Bridge Family Manifesto. But those 12 couplings of distinctives, when you take them individually, they each one bring, to, uh, bring us to this 24 distinctives. And again, in our come and see Christianity and in our broader discipleship time, we bring a deeper explanation to each one of these. Again, at all five levels, first for the lost, then the lover, the learner, the leader, and the lifer. So this, this is our vision and an understanding that without vision, the people perish. So let me stop here. We've, we've taken a time and I've, I know that it's like drinking from a fire hose. So let me just hit pause for a minute and see if there are any questions. And again, we'll come back at the end if something doesn't get addressed. Sandy, is there any question that you see or that has been shared that we can we can speak to on this? Yeah, this is a lot of good stuff. Thanks, Pastor Jeff. This is awesome. Yeah, um, so one of the questions is, um, when did the revelation of this design of discipleship, when did that happen for you? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I'll give you an answer, which is honest, but I want you to know it's really irrelevant because I'm not really a key part in this. It's, it's God and his word, uh -huh. but this has been something that has been growing in me for years, years and years. And so different pieces have come into their 
uh, final format at different times. I'm, I'm going to share something with you at the very end that, that the Lord gave me last week and was a part of our sharing on Sunday. So it, it's not so much the, the Pastor Jeff component as it is mm -hmm. the Prince Jesus. Uh, this is all from him and his word and uh, nothing else, really. So when, you're, so when you started your church, did you have a discipleship plan already? Um, did you struggle with that? How, how, did, how did that look for you? Yeah, that's wonderful. I, uh, it's a great question. I was very blessed. Uh, I mm -hmm. don't have a long church history. Uh, I showed up on the doorsteps of Southern Seminary as one who knew one thing. I knew that I didn't know. I knew that God had called me. I knew that I needed to be uh, equipped biblically. And I was blessed to have that happen. And uh, I've learned an awful lot um, in the 20 years that uh, God has had me. But what I've learned over and over again is to go back to his word. Uh, because mm -hmm. frankly, um, I come from the business world. I've got a marketing background. I was a sales executive. And what I learned early on is that if you sell Jesus, there are people that will buy him. Mm -hmm. And uh, early on, I took my marketing world and my missionary training and I put them together and things went just like everybody would expect. And uh, everybody except for the Lord, because when our church began to explode with growth, I baptized over 150 people in the first three years. Um, everybody loved our church, but I noticed there were only a handful of people that loved Jesus. Mm. And the Lord took me behind the woodshed and said, uh, I want you to begin to preach more application. And I'll tell you what, that'll thin a herd. Um, mm. Everybody wants to be made much of. And again, there's a lot of consumerism. And when you adhere to the attraction model of church, what you do is not only attract consumers, you build consumers. Mm. And I think that's the cancer and the corruption in the church today. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're not going to storm the gates of hell with consumers. Mm. And uh, what we're called to be are discipled warriors. And so the Lord, um, he, he did a number on me and said, stop worrying about the attraction and put your focus on the almighty and mm -hmm. make sure that there's a clear understanding of what it means to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. And so some of what, you'll, what you've already seen and some of what I'll share here in a little bit are all coming out of that. I'll tell you back to the first question that it was inside two years when uh, the Lord gave me most of what you're seeing. Okay. And how long had you been in that is in that in the span of the first two years of your ministry? As you were getting uh, going as a church? I'm sorry, what was the question about the first two years? So it, so you said, you know, you said this came together like in a two year span. So was that at the beginning of your church ministry, you know, or or after you had this uh, behind the shed experience with the Lord? Yeah, it it was revelation almost from the beginning. Okay. It was application at about two to three years in. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. And it's been, it's been, you know, growing right. ever since. Okay. Well, there are some other questions, but I have a feeling you might be addressing some of them. So I'll, I'll hold those off till the next time. Okay. Well, let's, let's press on then okay. to mission. So we've talked about the essential necessity for biblical vision. Let's now talk about biblical mission. And here again, we've just touched on it. Mission is not about getting bigger buildings mission is not about building a bigger crowd. Mission is not about what so much of the church world has become. Let me just remind you, Jesus said, John 20, 21, as the father has sent me, so now I send you. And Jesus never sought to build a crowd through meeting the needs of what would attract people. He never had the big light show and the smoke machines. He didn't worry about wearing skinny jeans and getting everybody to like him. What he did was he proclaimed the truth in love. He said, as the father sent me, as he sent me, so now I send you. Most of you will be familiar with the great commission, Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. All authority. Therefore, you now go 
make disciples. Don't make consumers. Don't, don't build crowds. Make disciples in part teaching them to obey. And he says, and go to all the world, all authority, all world, teach them to obey all that I commanded, not suggested. And he says, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. We need to make sure that we have a biblical mission. And notice, if you don't have the vision, you won't go on the mission. If you lose the vision, you lose the mission. If somebody corrupts the vision, they corrupt the mission. It must be biblical. Now, you see on the screen there a little image that we use. The uh, Christ crash in T9s. There's a story behind it. Erwin McManus wrote a book called The Barbarian Way. And in it, he speaks about uh, what happens when you see a group of rhinos running. He first points out that rhinos average about six or 7,000 pounds. They run upwards of 30 miles an hour, but they can only see about 30 feet in front of them. And he says, you know, what's beautiful, when you see this gathering of rhinos, the literal term for that gathering of charging rhinos is a crash. And he says, you know, the church really needs to be like that crash. We have so much in us. It doesn't matter if we don't know what's coming around the corner. When you're a 6,000 pound rhino and you're running 30 miles an hour with some rhinos next to you, you don't worry about what's in front of you. The fact that you only see 30 feet is not a big deal because it's either going to get out of your way or it's going to get run over. And that needs to be the attitude of the Christian that we realize we need not fear in this world. We are overwhelming overcomers, Romans 8, 37. And the T9 comes from our brother, Pastor Frederick in Kenya, part of our bridge family, who said as he was coming into our family, he said, what I'm hearing and what we're seeing with this discipleship, it's not attraction oriented. He said, it's like the T9. I said, a T9, what's a T9? He said, the T9 is the machine that we see that comes to Kenya when you know there's going to be a path cleared through the forest. The T9s go, and it doesn't matter how big the tree, it doesn't matter how big the rock, the T9 moves everything like God and his truth and love. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand that the mission is what Christ has given us and the model that he shared. In short, we love God, we love people, and we serve the world. We live out a devotion to bringing glory to God by making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. That's what he's given us. We like to say it this way. It's to be the church. And that's a picture of a quilt that hangs in our sanctuary in Maryland, where our bridge family began. And that quilt represents a metaphor for the church. It's made up of scrap swatches. Independently, they can do nothing. But woven together with the red thread of the gospel, not only does it become something that's beautiful, but it shows unity through diversity. It shows life-saving warmth. This is a portrait of the church. Our mission is to be the church, to be the Christ followers whose love for God, whose love for one another, and whose commitment to serve selflessly will arrest the attention of the onlooking world. We are, John 17, verse 21 through 27, or 23, we are that witness whose supernatural unity, whose love for one another is going to be the calling card of Christ. This is what it is to be the church. This is the mission. And again, it's a local, regional, and global mission. Sandy, you asked what time was it in India? I can tell you because those are some of our bridge brothers that have connected. Panchwi, Abhinash, Sojal, Sumanta, Sunil. It was 6 a.m. in India when we began. These are our brothers. This is a part of our family. Our mm -hmm. family in Africa, it's 3.30 in the morning where it was when we began. Um, it's a true love for one another. It's a true biblical unity that our mission is to be this supernaturally unified people. Part of that mission, I call it the seven eyes of biblical discipleship. It is in practicality, it's understanding that we're going to be the people who initiate, 
Now, by initiating, we understand that nothing happens unless God initiates with us. So God initiates by starting with grace. He graces us, and then we respond with repentance and belief. Then we, now as believers, as true Christians, as biblical disciples, we embrace the call that we need to initiate. We go. We don't wait for people to come. We don't ask, and we'll wait for people to ask us. We go as those Christ-like Christians who are going to initiate going to others. We go to others and we invite. So the question becomes, who do we invite? We invite all. Again, remember that the invitation of the gospel is for all people, for God so loved the world. And yet, not all of the world and not all people will be saved. So we invite all, but number three, then we invest in the few. We invest in the few who respond. You see, biblical discipleship takes the tension that calls us to understand nothing happens unless God initiates with us. And then if he initiates with us, we have now the privilege and responsibility to initiate with others. So the question is who? The answer, everyone. We sow where, when I was ordained, I was prayed over and I had the privilege to pray this prayer over my son as I preach his ordination service. The prayer goes like this, Lord, may we be double-fisted seed sowers who grow comfortable behind the plow. Mm -hmm. We invite everyone as double-fisted seed sowers. And at the same time, we don't invest heavily in everyone. We invest in those who respond, the few, as Jesus put it. Those who prove to be, or at least initiate themselves being fat, faithful, available, and teachable. We invite all, and then we invest in the fat ones, the faithful, the available, and the teachable. And you say, well, what do you mean by invest? Number four, we begin to inform them. We teach, we equip, we disciple, we pour our lives into others. In that informing, it gives rise to then inspecting. If you love them, you will inspect them. It's not enough to just do a data dump on somebody. It's not enough to say, well, I'm sure they're getting it. If you love them, you'll inspect them. After the inspecting, you hope to have this time where you're now seeing an inspirational component. So we initiate, we invite, we invest, we inform, we inspect, and then we seek to inspire. As Paul said, follow me as I follow the Lord. And we make sure that the inspiration is not of personal attraction, but that it's truly pointing to Christ. And notice, we don't just leave with inspiration. We want to make sure that there's true impact. It's not enough to say or to think, boy, I really inspired that person. True biblical missional discipleship is not going to stop until there is either impact or clarity as to why there isn't impact. So here again, it's a quick overview, but it's to understand the mission. The mission is to fulfill what Jesus has called us to do and to be. And that's ultimately seen in being the church, being the witnesses that will arrest the attention of the world in our loving up, our loving in, and our loving out. And we do this by initiating, inviting, investing, informing, inspecting, inspiring, and ultimately impacting for the glory of God. So we've seen now biblical vision, and we've seen a need for biblical mission. The next one that we'll get into is biblical definitions. And I'm going to define for you discipleship, I'm going to define for you the gospel, and define for you the church. But let's stop here again and just see if there's some more questions that we can address and hopefully help with. Okay. Um, Will you talk about spiritual warfare as you're coming up? Or is this a good place? Um, the, the question is, how can we fight spiritual warfare? Um, you know, because I think you've painted a great picture of, um, you know, how it would look. Um, but practically, how does that play out, especially in spiritual warfare? Sure. Great, great question. 
And here again, we've, we've done a ton of very deep and in-depth teaching and equipping. Uh, literally have done, uh, we call them AITs, Advanced Individual Training, on each component of the full armor of God, which would be one response. But let me, let me give you an answer that is comprehensive and true, and at the same time, very concise. Uh, we're walking through as a church, Psalm 119, uh, as a sermon series. And on Sunday, I preached from Psalm 119, verse 9, and following through verse 16. Psalm 119, verse 9, answers that question very directly. The psalm verse is broken into a question and an answer. Verse 9a asks the question, how is a young man to keep his way pure? Verse 9b answers the question. So here's God's answer to God's question. Guarding, guarding your way according to God's word. That's the short answer. It's being and being in direct proportion to guarding your way according to, so there's a standard here. There's mm. a, a metrics according to God's word. And so that could include everything from fear not, the most repeated command in all the Bible, mm -hmm. fear not. Another one um, in our training and in uh, the sermon on Sunday, we ended with Philippians 4, 8 and 9. Think on all these things that are inherent to God's word, God's will and God's way. And then practice these things that are inherent to God's word, God's will, and God's ways. So that would be a short answer to a very deep question. But again, I'm not, I'm not being trite or, or short with the question. That's pure biblical answer to that really important question. Okay. And I'm, I'm thinking you're going to address, uh, because, uh, you know, I know discipleship isn't just for adults. And somebody's asked a question about, um, you know, kids and how this would work and, you know, how this looks, you know, across the ages. Yeah. Amen. Let me, let me answer that briefly and then we'll go into some definitions, but um, right. it's an absolutely critical point and something that we embrace entirely. The come and see Christianity curriculum that you're seeing some pieces of here tonight you can see that the graphics and the, the artwork, it's very child-friendly, it's on purpose. Uh, it's also very uh, cross-cultural. Stick men are stick men and <laughs> they work everywhere. There's no country, there's no culture, um, but we are currently in the process of taking the come and see Christianity teaching and curriculum and we're developing it at five levels of youth, from literally toddler to then first, second grade, then a late elementary, then middle school, and then a high school level. Mm -hmm. um, it's critical to understand that uh, our children desperately need Christ. And I've heard, I've heard different numbers thrown around, but it's a very large number that uh, if somebody has not come to Christ, early in their life, they're most likely not coming. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we take, we've said from the very beginning, day one, we don't babysit kids at the bridge, we disciple them. Mm -hmm. And so we're committed, our, our children's ministry is called Bridge Builders. We're building little bridges to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if you give us an infant, we're praying over the infant. If mm -hmm. you give us a toddler, we're pouring in. This curriculum is used with our, our tiniest ones. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, if you want to be inspired, where do you see a four-year-old share the gospel in a way that most adults aren't ready or capable of sharing? It's amazing mm -hmm. what children are capable of retaining and sharing. And it's critical that we understand that they need this truth and love. They mm -hmm. don't need to be babysat for a couple of hours so mom and dad can have a little downtime. They need Jesus. And we take that to heart. They certainly are sponges. And, and, and so in your discipleship of adults, um, you're teaching them then how to disciple their children at home. So it's not just the church doing the discipleship, but it's a, uh, you know, you could you use the word holistic. And I'm assuming that holistic means you're uh, preparing them to, you know, carry it 
not only out to people they don't know, but to their into their homes? Yeah, I would say it this way, Sandy, that we bring personal accountability and responsibility, which starts mm -hmm. at home and works out in concentric circles out to the world and across okay. the globe. Great. And, and understanding that this is a call on every believer's life. Mm -hmm. And it starts, starts in your heart, works through your kitchen, then in your community, then in your country, and then across the continents. Amen. And so... Okay. Uh, All right. Amen. Carry All right. on then. Carry on. All right. <laughs> well, let's let's move forward then to definition. And here you see First Timothy four sixteen, where God's word says, "To take heed, guard your life and your doctrine. By doing so, you may save your life and that of those who hear you." And here we just want to point out how critically important it is, especially in today's age that our conversations not just be grounded in the same vocabulary, but in the same definitions. Too many times people are using the same words, but meaning different things. Same words, different terms. Their definitions are different. And this point is grounded in the fact that the Bible is God's word, and that God's word applies to all aspects of life and is the authority and the arbiter over all things. Again, back to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. If you find somebody who is either divorced from the authority of God's word or who is perverting the authority of God's word, you're in a very dangerous place. And again, it's no longer biblical discipleship. So when we talk about discipleship, here's my definition. Discipleship is the intentional endeavors of miraculous Christ-like works in progress. That's my definition for a biblical disciple. Miraculous, Christ-like works in progress. And they are engaged, engaged in finding the lost and growing the found into family members. That's huge. Who are in turn themselves committed, again, huge, to making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. All by God's grace, all through the gospel and all for God's glory. This is what that looks like. If you go back to what we call the framework, or in some of my tools, I call it the life cycle. Discipleship is the head, heart, and hands effort of engaging the lost, explaining, equipping, empowering, or exemplifying. This is, this is what is happening if and when we've got biblical discipleship taking place. And just a quick note, discipleship doesn't happen after salvation. Notice this, we disciple lost people. Now, not all lost people end up getting saved. But if you think that discipleship starts after salvation, you're not biblical. Jesus was discipling the disciples long before they became Christ followers and true biblical Christians. We need to understand that discipleship begins with prayer and it goes into the darkness. And we're going to try to disciple people who ultimately one day will turn away. That's part of it. We must understand this. But let me press in a little bit further and let's give some clarity. I promised you some definitions before. This is the lost person. By definition, and again, these are my terms, but let, let the truth from God's word come through whatever vocabulary you want to use. But a lost person they are those who are wrongly and rebelliously related to the God of the Bible, the spiritually blind and stubborn. They are neither surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ nor filled with his spirit. While such souls are often religious, they remain unrepentant, unbelieving, unfruitful, and disobedient. The lost are spiritually dead, spiritually dead sinners. Look what happens now when we come up to the lover. They've come through the cross. They're born again. They're no longer dead. They have eternal life, but they're different. They're not like all the other Christians. They're special. And, and what's important to see here is your discipleship must have an intentionality, a vision and a mission to the lost, must have a vision and a mission to the lover, to the learner, to the leader, and to the lifer. It's custom fitting where people are. And so you need to understand who are such people? How, how do you see the distinction? Well, the lover, it represents all born again, 
Holy Spirit filled, repentant and faithful, infant followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lovers are miraculously changed, while often missionally immature. They are infilled, but not fully informed. They are eternally saved, but not yet missionally shaped. Lovers are saved sinners. Now note, lost people are dead sinners. Lovers are saved sinners, also known as a biblical disciple. And they are now ready for and in need of maturing discipleship. It's like that spiritual, um, that physical infant. The infant needs the mother to nurture. They can't do a whole lot, but they're alive. They're in the family. They need nurturing. And that nurturing leads to what we see now, the leader. This is like the spiritual teenager, the one who is still growing, not fully grown and not yet, not still a child. The learner is a born again, growing, fruit producing, biblical follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, a spiritual adolescent, complete with their typical ups and downs. Discovery and development amidst a dark and distracting world are daily dynamics in the learner's life as they are actively and intentionally discipled in how to live and love in the light of their new Christian identity. You can see you don't treat your 16-year-old the same way you do your two-year-old. And in the same way, you don't treat your 16-year-old the same way you do your 26-year-old. That's a leader. That's now the spiritual adult. The spiritual leader is a stable, born-again spiritual adult, a disciple whose DNA and discipleship, both inward and outward, they're receiving discipleship and they're giving discipleship, are producing a pattern of missional, Christ-like, servant-oriented, multiplying fruit, all in the context of faithfully following the Lord Jesus Christ. Leaders are active fishers of men, spiritual pillars, koinonia championing chaperones, and they're also spiritual parents in the family of God. You see, you treat them and you disciple them differently. If you just say, well, we disciple this way and it's a one size fits all, how in the world can you be effective in reaching out and discipling lost lovers, learners, leaders? And here, I pray you see, when we get to the lifer, this is the, the spiritual the spiritual model, the, the example, they are imperfect, but passionate, all in biblically mature, fully devoted followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lifers are missionally and exponentially fruit producing servant leaders. Lifers are a God given gift to the church. Lifers are the spiritual under shepherds with God given authority and responsibilities. They are equippers who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. You see, this, this is the definition of discipleship and what it looks like. And now I want to show you what the gospel looks like by definition. And this is a portrait. We call it the stick man gospel. You see that all of the gospel comes from heaven, comes down from above. It leads to the MMM. It leads with a miracle that turns dead people into living people. It happens through the capital M Messiah at his cross, and it leads to a life on mission where the gospel has really taken place. Dead people come alive by the grace and through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they become missionaries. This graphic, it's very, very, very deep in its meaning. And this is where I was sharing earlier. When you have a four-year-old share this with you and walk you through it, it's inspirational because what we see is there's a danger. There are those who are not Christians who jump over the cross. There are those who are wolves in sheep's clothing who tunnel under the cross. And then there's the real sheep, the family of God, who go from dead to alive, who come to and through the cross of Christ. Now, this is critically important, and I'll show it to you, all scripturally based. To walk through this diagram is to understand the comprehensive gospel in its fullness. And it's 100% biblical. And it comes with a warning because if you look on the right side of the screen, you see one person carrying the cross, but there's actually going to be three people there. The one who climbed over the cross, that's a spiritual goat. The one who tunneled under the cross, that's a spiritual wolf. And the one who came through the cross, the sheep 
who could even include those that grow into shepherds. Now, watch what happens if I show this to you as now the Stickman Church. All three of those are in the church. This is the visible church. This is what is doing so much damage in the world today. You've got goats and wolves in with the sheep. And where and when discipleship and church life, Christianity is not biblical, not being maintained and taught and guarded biblically, you end up with a culture seeing a church that is two-thirds corrupt. And this is not the biblical church. If we don't understand, we don't have a vision for biblical church, if we don't have the mission of being biblical church, if we don't have the biblical definitions of who's who in the church, we're in a world of trouble. And that's what we see. This image as well, again, there's a lot deeper teaching, but it's 100% biblically explained and reinforced. This is to understand the definition of discipleship, understand the definition of the gospel, to understand the definition of the biblical church, what's right and righteous about it, and what's wrong and dangerous. So again, just a, a portrait of the need in principle for biblical vision, biblical mission, biblical definitions. And let me stop here. The last session will be quicker, but I don't want to go without giving an opportunity to see if there are any other questions. Yes, and be sure if you do have questions, you want to get them in that chat. Um, so a couple of questions that did come in about, um, and you might be talking about this in a few minutes, um, you know, what's the preference or, I, I mean, I, I bet you use both one-on-one -on -one discipleship and small groups. You know, what does that look like? Yeah, so discipleship biblically is life on life. Mm -hmm. And life on life is literally life on life. And so there are times and contexts that will be one-on-one. -on -one. It'll be a few. It, you know, I think about it in terms of personal, which is vertical. Then the essence of a pod, three, you know, that you want to have a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. Somebody that's pouring into you, somebody that you're rubbing shoulders with, and somebody that you're pouring into. Okay. Then you want to have that, that posse. That, uh, that small group that you run with, that you do life with, that's really, truly intimate. And I'm also a veteran. You want to have a platoon. <laughs> you want to have that larger group that's ready to go to war and capable of going to war together. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's discipleship in the context of all of that. It, it's really, it's a, it's a biblical, I, I've been asked, Sandy, People have said to me, you know, you guys, it's a little different. Where'd you get that model? You know, what's mm -hmm. your strategy? And they say, our model is the Bible. It's the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. Our strategy is faithful obedience. No more, no less. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even as a twice appointed North American Mission Board church planting missionary, I, I no longer accept that term. We're not church planters. We're gospel planters. Now, if, if the Lord were to send 20 or 30 someplace, yeah, that's, that's a plant of a church. That's a, a group going. But um, in both cases, we've been gospel planters. Uh, they said at one time we were a parachute drop. You know, you're, you're being dropped into an area, but you're a church planter. And I, I've come to realize, no, no, we're gospel planters. God, God builds his church. We, we plant the gospel. He raises up the church. And so it's really just doing life in every context of life and mm -hmm. not putting things into compartments or hat wearing, you know, mm -hmm. oh, it's Sunday. I'm, I'm Pastor Jeff today. No, I'm always right. Pastor Jeff. You right. Know? right. Um, and yeah. that should, and that's not because of my title. That's because of my relationship with Christ. Okay. And the same is true for every believer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, well, I'll let you get on to the last one because it is 8.30, so I'll let you get on okay. to the last one, and I do have a couple more questions, so. Okay, so let, let's just go on then to the last piece, which is devotion, and uh, this is something I like to say often, and it's been a bit of a lightning rod in my ministry, but 99% obedience is 100% disobedience. 
devotion is understanding that there's no cant or compromise on this side of the cross, and there never was any self-preservation in the gospel. Devotion is to literally say, no matter what, I'm going to live out as best I can the right attitude and the right actions to the glory of God. And that if we have any hope of going from the default position where we all begin, we begin wrong with God. Our attitude is selfish. Our actions are rebellious. Nobody starts off in a right place or a righteous place with God. And every one of us are going to go through battles on the way. But if you've received the miracle and you've come into the rightness of attitude and the righteousness of actions, then that happened through the Messiah at the cross. And then the rest of our lives will be lived out on mission. As we go from not just being right, but seeking out the righteousness of Christ. And that is a no matter what call and commissioning. For those that would doubt, again, 99% obedience is 100% disobedience. It's Jesus who said in John 14, 15, if, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Now, that's not a call to or an expectation of perfection. It's not saying that if you're not perfect, you don't love Jesus. But if the pattern and the trajectory of one's life is not in that pursuit of purity, in that pattern of seeking righteousness, then you're not talking about somebody who has the devotion that biblical discipleship not only calls for, but is defining of the biblical Christian. You know, I ask people often, what do you call a follower who doesn't follow? And the answer is a liar. You know, and I think, again, because we don't have biblical standards, we don't have biblical vision, we don't have biblical mission, we don't have biblical definitions. We, for example, when we talk about being a fisher of men, I see people that go and hang out around the lake and they have picnics. They, they buy fishing equipment. They talk about fishing. They got the most beautiful tackle box, but they're not fishing. So what do you call a fisher of men who doesn't fish? Well, they're not a fisher of men. They might be picnic goers, but they're not fishers. And on that point, let me just also be clear. If you look at the ministry of Christ and you read the word of God, there's never any fishing with bait. Jesus never fished with bait. We cast the net of the gospel. We don't fish with bait. We're not hiding any hooks. We're not putting anything sweet on the end, trying to attract them to come when later we'll give them the bait and switch and tell them, well, you see, it never really was about you. Now it's time for you to serve the Lord. No, always truth and love. And devotion says, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. I just show it to you one more time. Um, I've lost, there we go. One last screen is, is to understand that when you look at the church, yeah, there are those in the lower left-hand quadrant. They reject Christ. They reject everything we've said. These are the evildoers. They don't pretend to like Christ. They don't pretend to obey God and his word. But then there are also those, the hypocrites, who seem to put on the front, the front and the face. They know all the right answers, but they're not walking their talk. And conversely, you see in the lower right, we have those who know all the right answers, the Pharisees, the legalists, those who are the holy hammers who are quick to come and say, do this, do that. And if you don't, you're going to hell, turn or burn. Neither one representing what is true Christ likeness, devotion is not putting on the hypocrite's mask or having the legalist hammer. Devotion is walking with Christ, and it's through the process of sanctification. John 17, 17, through the truth of God's word, we're refined as we pursue his righteousness. And we do this, as we see in Philippians 1, as those who seek to live out a life worthy of the gospel. That's devotion. It's also Ephesians 4.1, where we live a life worthy of our calling. It, it's to seek to bring glory to God with joy in our heart, being the church, 
with biblical vision, biblical mission, biblical definitions, and biblical devotion. No more, no less, no matter what. That, I pray, is a blessing that will help. That's a quick overview of the principles that will undergird biblical discipleship versus what's happening in the cultural church. So mm. I'll, I'll leave it there and thank you again for the privilege to share what is my passion and again, my privilege. It certainly is. It certainly is. And so I got two more questions for you. Sure. Um, what does outreach look like? Hmm. Amen. Outreach looks like getting outside of your comfort zone. Okay. And for every person, it's going to be customized to them. That for one person, outreach may look one way, and for another person, it may look another. Here's what it's not. It's not a program. It's not mm -hmm. a formula. It's not this idea that, well, on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, we go to the park and we clean up the park. That's not outreach. Outreach is going and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ with both your lips and your life. Sometimes the best outreach is going to be coming alongside somebody who's hurting mm -hmm. and just loving them, but really loving them. And here's another thing, just as a part of that answer, when love becomes a strategy, it's manipulation. That's not God's way. That's not biblical. When somebody's form of outreach is really a strategy, that's not love and that's not outreach. That's manipulation. That's marketing done with some sophistication. And again, I know that world. I was a manipulator. So outreach is really getting outside of your comfort zone for the glory of God and the blessing of others. And that can come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. The key is that it's Christ-centered mm -hmm. and that it involves both lips and lives. Okay. So that's a great question. Okay. Yeah. And then um, finally, you know, have you noticed any, you know, we've been in a couple of years now of this COVID, you know, how has that impacted discipleship? You know, do you do it differently? Are you doing it more online? Is it not in person as much? you know, has, or has there not been an impact? Yeah, I love that question. I love it. Let me tell you the impact that COVID has had on our ministry, like gas on a fire. Mm. We have spread like wildfire to the glory of God. And it's because in this time of COVID, I'll tell you what happens. Consumers go home mm. and superficial relationships wither up. But when the storm comes and there's real Christ-centered love and the mission is understood and what unites you is the vision and the mission and the definitions and a devotion to the Lord, well, you realize that this is a time for all hands on deck mm -hmm. and that you see the biblical God in and through all of this. We recognize, we, we have the vaccine. His name is Jesus. You know, we, we don't need some superficial Moderna or Pfizer. That stuff will come and go. We have what the world needs and we realize it. And we've been blessed uh, literally to spread all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it's because we have truth and love and mm -hmm. nothing has changed. And Sandy, this is one of the mm -hmm. greatest blessings of, of God's hand on us. Mm -hmm. We've been doing what we're doing right now, literally for nine years, mm -hmm. and it has not changed. And so when COVID hit and everybody said, oh, we've got to change all of our models, our model didn't change. Today, two plus years after, we're the same as we were two weeks before COVID, two years before that. Mm -hmm. because, and, and the key is, because we're being biblical mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and all, all we've done, we didn't change our models and we didn't go and figure, we've just been using everything that God's given us to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples mm -hmm. locally, regionally, and globally. And again, I, I suspect, you know, there'll be things that'll shift and change, but because our core 
is the biblical truth and love. That's why it's, it's working in Africa. It's working in Asia. It's working in the North. It's working in the South. Because mm-hmm. it's God. It's God right. and his blueprint. His blueprint is bullseye. Mm-hmm. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you. And I want to tell everybody, I'll, um, I'll be putting together a resource sheet. So some of the uh, principles you've talked about tonight, just so many have been trying to write everything down. Plus, you have a resource, and I'm going to send one out when I get my box of resources. I'm going to send them out. Uh, everybody will get a copy of that um, so that, you know, you could look at that. And certainly um, uh, reach out to Pastor Jeff, um, and I'll make sure you have his contact information if you want to talk about that. And, um, uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. We will have the recording and we'll send that out as well. I'll be sending that out as soon as it's edited so that you can share it with um, anybody in your network that might be helpful. But you'll also get that resource, which is a book, correct? You've you've yes. put together a book. And so we want to put that in your hands and you may be able to use some of that and certainly reach out to Pastor Jeff and he'd be happy to um, you know, walk alongside you and answer any other further questions. That'd be great. Amen. Great. Well, thank you. I want to I want to thank you again, Sandy, for the opportunity, and for those that have joined us. Thank you for investing the time. I pray that the blessing um, will be something that is a gift that keeps on giving. Absolutely, absolutely. And you'll see Pastor Jeff's uh, contact information there up on the screen, and um, and I'll make sure you get that again uh, in the next day or so. And also next Monday we're doing a webinar on uh, church revitalization, and that might be something you're interested in. And you can always um, check that out at bcne.net/slash events, and you can sign up there. But that's going to be next Monday night with Gary Moritz. He's our church revitalization leader here in New England. So, so glad you could be here, Pastor Jeff. I'd ask if you could close us in prayer, and then we'll um, say goodbye. Amen. It'd be my blessing. Lord, thank you so much for this time. I thank you for those who have a heart and an interest, a passion, I pray, for making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Lord, may it be your word, your will, and your ways that we bring locally, regionally, and globally no matter what. Mm. I thank you for Sandy opening up this window and this door of opportunity. I pray that you have touched hearts and that you've made an eternal impact tonight. May you get all the glory. We thank you and love you in Jesus name. Amen. And amen. Amen. All right. If you have any further questions, please um, put those in the chat. And uh, Tiffany says, thank you. We love you, Pastor Jeff. That's good. Thank you. (laughs) Awesome. Great. So glad. Yep. Lots of thank yous here. Thank you for your teaching. Good stuff. Really good stuff. Awesome. 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 All right. Be blessed and have a blessed night. Thank you very much, everybody. Take care. We'll see you soon. Good night.